Introducing our speaker today is Paul Ingrassi. Paul spent 31 years with the Wall Street Journal and its parent company, Dow, Dow Jones, as a reporter, an editor, and also an executive. As the journal's Detroit bureau chief, from 1985 to 1994, Mr. Ingrassia won a Pulitzer Prize, along with his deputy, Joseph P. White. They won that in 1993 for coverage of General Motors. He has also received the Loeb Lifetime Achievement Award for business and financial journalism. He has written three significant books about automobiles and the auto industry. And he's retired, uh, just retired in 2016 as managing editor of Reuters. So please welcome Paul Ingracia, who will introduce our, our speaker, Mr. Yoshida. Paul. Well, thank you, uh, President Paul, for that very kind introduction. Since you, since you mentioned the Pulitzer Prize, it came my way um, 25 years ago this week, and I'll tell you a quick story. One of my sons, Charlie, who was then in junior high school, uh, went to school the next day, and he told his teacher his dad had just won the Pulitzer Surprise. <laughs> he had it about right. <laughs> I want to start out by um, invoking some well-known names who are uh, founders, if you will, of the American automobile industry. Um, Henry Ford, Alfred P. Sloan, Jr., and Walter Chrysler. Indeed, they're pioneers of what has been one of the leading, perhaps the leading, industry in America. And I want to add another name to that list. That name would be Shige Yoshida. Now, obviously, Mr. Yoshida is not ordinarily mentioned alongside Ford and Sloan and Chrysler, but he should be. Mr. Yoshida is one of the true pioneers of the second great phase of the American automobile industry, its globalization phase. Now, globalization has been a defining force in shaping not just the automobile industry, but indeed our entire world during the last half century. And just how our speaker today became a defining pioneer of globalization, which can be defined as free people and free markets, as my former employer, the Wall Street Journal, puts it often on the editorial page. This is a remarkable story. Now, I've heard it said uh, with affection that Mr. Yoshida looks a little bit like Yoda from the Star Wars movies. <laughs> I'll let each of you judge that for yourselves. But this is clear. He certainly needed the wisdom of Yoda to locate and build and staff Honda's first American manufacturing operations. Now, of course, he did all that in Marysville, Ohio, just up the road from here. We take Honda's presence there for granted today, but we shouldn't. Just think about what Mr. Yoshida did. He was born in Yokohama in 1932 and grew up amid the devastation of post-war Japan. He joined Honda in 1962. In 1973, he was sent to America, the country that had defeated Japan and occupied it. He was assigned to a Honda subsidiary that exported American products back to Japan. After all, why let the boats that brought Honda cars to America sail back empty. But then, in a most unexpected turn, his bosses at Honda Honsha in Tokyo asked him to organize a feasibility study to explore producing vehicles in America. The location of that first factory would be critical. Now, the state of Nevada wanted this factory, but Mr. Yoshida concluded that Las Vegas was better suited for, shall we say, other pursuits. <laughs> then Mr. Yoshida went to Sacramento to talk to Jerry Brown, who was then and now governor of California. <laughs> Mr. Yoshida, this must seem like back to the future, I think. <laughs> 
Governor Moonbeam, as Mr. Brown was then known, lived up to his nickname. He told Mr. Yoshida and his Honda colleagues that California was a great place to build cars because hippies, blue jeans, all the great trends start right here in California. Mr. Yoshida, for some reason, decided to continue his search elsewhere. <laughs> he eventually chose Ohio for its culture of diligence. Now that was critical, as Mr. Yoshida explained to me in a marvelous seven hour, yes, seven hour, uh, interview in Los Angeles nearly a decade ago. Also, Governor Jim Rhodes was as eager as Governor Brown to get this factory, but he was perhaps a bit more credible. Now, to find diligent employees, Mr. Yoshida gave each job applicant a name tag, and he instructed them to put the name tag on their right shoulder. Those who put it on their left shoulder or who lost their name tag were quickly rejected. Mr. Yoshida believed that disciplined attention to detail is critical to quality manufacturing. Now let's put this in perspective. At that very same time, Volkswagen was manufacturing cars in America too. But the VW factory south of Pittsburgh was on the verge of failure. It never escaped the Detroit mentality of management labor conflict that Honda thanks to Mr. Yoshida, avoided. Indeed, a tipping point in this conflict was how Honda dealt with the United Automobile Workers Union. The UAW wanted and pretty much assumed that Honda management would support its efforts to represent the Marysville employees. What is not well known is that senior management back in Tokyo also assumed the same thing. But Mr. Yoshida was not a yes man. He was not just willing to tell the bosses only what they wanted to hear. He did his own independent research on this critical issue. And he determined that Honda should not automatically recognize the UAW. So in the end, Honda's top executives back in Tokyo reluctantly acceded to Mr. Yoshida's point of view. And the employees at Marysville also rejected UAW representation. So what was the upshot of all that? Pretty simple and pretty profound. In one fell swoop, Honda broke the corporate oligopoly and the labor monopoly that had dominated the American automobile industry for half a century. The winners were American consumers as well as Honda employees at all levels. Thanks to Mr. Yoshida, there were and are no executive parking spaces at Marysville and no executive dining room. Everyone, whatever their rank, wears the same uniform. Now, yes, these are symbolic things, but symbols are important, and especially symbols of respect and unity as all Americans might well remember these days. Now think about this. If Honda had failed in America, just as Volkswagen did, companies headquartered outside the United States probably would have concluded that operating in America with American workers would be impossible. And in that case, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Toyota, Nissan, Hyundai, Denso, and a host of other companies would not be manufacturing in America today. Nor would many, many companies, foreign headquartered companies outside the auto industry. Now, if we're honest here, we will acknowledge that these days globalization gets a bad rap from some people. Okay, fair enough. In any seismic economic change, there are losers as well as winners. And it's our obligation as a society to help those who are displaced adjust to the new order. But in truth, the global integration of the world's economy has lifted tens of millions of people 
out of poverty in the last century. Very few of these people know about Shige Yoshida, but they should know about him, and so should we, because we all owe him a debt of thanks. Free people and free markets. Now, I said enough here, actually, perhaps too much, so I'm honored and pleased to introduce to you Mr. Shige Yoshida. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm not a great man. But I have had the joy of working with great men and women who were my fellow associates at Honda. Six months ago, your fellow Rotarian, Scott, asked me if I would come and talk about my experiences. I asked if I could come in April when I know the weather in Ohio would be good. <laughs> and it is, at last. <laughs> Scott likes to ask questions. And he asked me to address why Honda chose Marysville and succeeded. Fortunately, I had the help of Susan Insley, who years ago was responsible for Honda's engine plant in Anna, Ohio. Susan began her career teaching history, and she has managed to preserve a lot of uh, the early history of Honda of America manufacturing. We call it HEM. I'm very grateful to her for help with this speech and the PowerPoint. Let me begin with Mr. Honda. As a boy, he was fascinated by motorized vehicles. At 13, he began work at an auto repair shop, then opened his own shop. By 30, his company was making piston rings the rings failed. He went to engineering school to study metallurgy at night for three years. His rings stopped failing. <laughs> Out of the rubble of World War II, he and his partner, Takeo Fujisawa, founded Honda Motor Company in 1948. In the first year, they developed a common philosophy, a vision of what a company should be. It should have an international viewpoint, satisfy the customer, respect its workers, act with integrity, think creatively. Mr. Honda handled engineering and research. Mr. Fujisawa handled the rest. They created a company that began with motorcycles, followed in 1962 with autos. It was the last company to start auto production in Japan. A small company with big dreams I joined Honda Motor in 1962, the year auto production began. I started in purchasing, analyzing financial information about suppliers. One day, Mr. Fujisawa came to our department. What are you doing? He asked. We are studying suppliers, we said. He exploded. You will never understand the suppliers sitting at their desk. You must go to the spot. 
to their plants, meet with managers and workers, look at the plant floor, what is the operation, stand at the gate when workers go to work and go home. Are they smiling? Are they eager to their job? This is how you can judge a supplier, not just by financial report. We did as he did, as he said. He was right. In 1973, I was sent to Gardena, California, Vice President Honda International Trading. Two years later, my whole life changed. In 1975, Honda introduced the Civic 1.2-liter CVCC engine, price $2,200, <laughs> a big hit. Sales of the Civic reached 100,000 units in the United States. Our U.S. dealers wanted more cars. In 1975, I was asked to organize a feasibility study team to investigate U.S. motor vehicle production and, if feasible, where, which state. Remember Mr. Fujisawa? I sat in many family restaurants in many states. I observed the people. What were they like? I was impressed by the people in Ohio. We decided to focus on Ohio. We studied many sites. None worked. We met the Governor Rose. He had come to Japan earlier to meet with Mr. Honda and push for Ohio. The Governor had Jim Dirk. Director of Development, show us more sites. By 1977, we had five marginal sites to consider. Mr. Suzuki, Senior Managing Director of Honda Motor, and Mr. Nakagawa, who would become the first president of HAM, came to Columbus to look at the site. Mr. Dirk arranged a tour of the five sites. He also included the Transportation Research Center. The TRC was not one of our, the five sites, but it was Governor Rose's pet project. When we got there, I had time to talk with managers and employees. They were proud to talk about their jobs, which were tough jobs. They were dedicated, showing up every day, doing the jobs well. Dedication, pride, and diligence, we would need that. I asked if there was land available. One of the employees immediately got a map. There was land next to the TRC. The three of us went back to Columbus to our hotel room in the downtown Sheraton, Third and Gay, sat on the floor, looked at our Ohio map at the five sites, looked at the Transportation Research Center, I talked about the people at the TRC, the people we had met that day. We chose the land beside the TRC. It was a winning site. In the morning, we went across the street to Governor Rose's office in the state capital. We told Governor Rose we hoped our site would be on the land just east of the TRC. Okay, he said. 
will buy it and give it to you. No thanks, Governor. We want to buy at a reasonable price. <laughs> On October 11, 1977, Honda and Ohio signed an inducement agreement. The state provided $2.5 million to assist in site development. Honda paid for the site and other costs. Reporters were surprised at the low dollar amount of state as assistance. A few years earlier, Volkswagen had encouraged a bidding war between Pennsylvania and Ohio. That was not our way. We broke ground for our motorcycle plant on April 3, 1978. Governor Rose and Honda Motor representative attended. The next week, Mr. and Mrs. Honda and the president of Honda Motor Company, Mr. Kawashima, came to Ohio. When their chartered plane arrived at Dunscott Airport, Governor Rhodes and his grandchildren welcomed them. One of the grandchildren is now the wife of your executive director, Scott Brown. <laughs> the governor also brought reporters with him. We were astounded. We had made no preparation for reporters. One reporter asked Mr. Honda, why did Honda choose Ohio? Without hesitating, he said, Providence guided us. Privately, he said, he did not want to make any comparison between Ohio and other states. After celebrating, work began. For the next year, we focused on site development, plant construction, hiring, and thinking about our company philosophy. We wanted our company philosophy to be based on Honda principles. What Mr. Honda and Mr. Fujisawa knew were important, respect, teamwork, highest quality, customer focus. How would Americans react? We knew all American auto companies had unionized workforces, and often management and labor fought each other. How could we change this? I found part of my answer through three American mentors, Mr. Irene Dupont. Dupont had planned in Ohio a mix of union and non-union. I went to Wilmington, Delaware to see him. He told me, those we bought were union, but those we opened are non-union. A non-union, open environment, is a much better way to operate. Management sets the tone. Mr. Lee Helen Jr., retired chair of O.M. Scott and Sons in Marysville. When my family and I moved to Marysville, our neighbors worked for Scott speaking highly of it. I met many times with Mr. Heron, who spoke of the importance of respecting workers, associates, as Scott called them. No need for conflict in the workplace. Mr. John McConnell, Sr., founder, chief, and chair and CEO 
of Washington Industries. I admired him so much. He told me of the wide flexibility given to Washington workers. They often know best what to do. No need for a union. In 1978, we hired our first American, Al Kinzer. Al had experience in manufacturing and became a great partner in developing our first policies. Everyone wears a white Honda uniform with first name on the shirt, covered buttons to protect the product. Honda ball cap issued to everyone. Only Honda hats can be worn at work. Common parking lot, locker rooms, and the cafeteria. Nothing reserved for management. Everyone is an associate. No probation period, full pay from day one. Attendance bonus. More than 3,000 people applied for the first jobs. Al and I hired 54. On September 10, 1979, the first Honda motorcycle came off the assembly line. Our managers and I wrote this motto. Our product built with pride. We ship quality to customers worldwide. The Honda motorcycle dealers were the next challenge we faced. Most of them wanted motorcycles made in Japan. Could the American really build quality motorcycles? We invited all dealers to come to Marysville. 600 came. After they saw our plant, after they talked with our associate, they said, how can we bring your associate's dedication back to our shop? We see your quality and your pride. We know you can do the job. In early 1980, Mr. Honda, returned to Ohio to see for himself how production was going. When I walked him into the plant, he darted to the assembly area and began shaking hands. He wanted to shake each associate's hand and thank each one for her or his good work. He waved smiled, and reached out for everyone. We had 300 associates at the time. He shook every hand. He saw the pride of our associate. He never wanted a financial report. Four months after we began motorcycle production, Honda Mora pre President, Mr. Kawashima, announced in Tokyo, Honda will build an auto plant at Marysville. $200 million investment, 120,000 cars per year, 2,000 new associates. My life would change again. The same month motorcycle production began, the United Auto Workers Union had opened an organizing office in Marysville. I knew something of unions. Honda has a company union in Japan. The relationship between management and the workers is different. Many union leaders are promoted into management and there are few major disputes. The UAW 
challenged us from the beginning. They threatened a boycott of Honda product if only Honda hats could be worn at work. Eventually, we agreed to allow other hats to be worn, but not those of competitors. <laughs> Honda's top manager in Japan were worried about the UAW. They pressured us to start talks. I never thought that was needed, but with such pressure, Al and I had three meetings with UAW officials over the next three years. During the two years after that, the meeting speeded up. Dan Minor, our attorney from the Boris firm here in Columbus, and I had a series of meetings, 20 in all, with two UAW officials at the Imperial House Hotel in Findlay. I talked about Honda's philosophy and the policies. The only benefit I got was to sense UAW organizing tactics. They became a bit frustrated with me. <laughs> On November 1, 1982, the first US-built Honda Accord came off the Marysville assembly line. As we prepared for auto production, we hired Bob Watson, a former Ranco executive, to be our vice president and auto plant manager. Bob led the development of Ham's operating principles. Working as a team, quality in all jobs, reliable products, open communication. Honda of America manufacturing, Ham, grew rapidly in the 1980s doubling the size of the Marysville auto plant, adding a new engine plant in Anna. Ham employed more than 2,500 associates. We established programs to encourage and recognize associate achievement. As the first Japanese company, to produce autos in America, we received many reporters, all, as, all seeking the secret of Ham's success. The UAW pushed hard in the mid-1980s. Nasty ads appeared in local newspapers and on radio. In October 1985, the United Auto Workers requested that Ham recognized it as the exclusive bargaining agent for our associate. Before this responding, we took a poll of associates. By three to one margin, our associate opposed automatic recognition of the union, preferring a secret ballot vote. Some associates formed an associate alliance opposing the UAW. I urged all associates to behave in a mature and calm manner, keep their attention on building quality product. Honda's top management in Japan was worried. Ham president, Mr. Irimajiri, and I were summoned by C Honda CEO Kume to Japan for a frank discussion. 
he wanted to know why we had not recognized the UAW. I did not talk about our attitude as management. I talked about what our associate wanted. Mr. Ely was uncomfortable. Mr. Kume was annoyed. But Mr. Kume had another appointment. The meeting ended without any other, many order to change our direction. During the plane trip back to the US, Mr. Iri asked me why I sat so far away during the meeting with Mr. Kume. Mr. Iri told me he had been trying to kick my leg under the table <laughs> to signal me to agree with Mr. Kume's wishes. But I knew that most harm associates did not want the UAW, and Americans would buy Honda product even if HEM were a non-union company. In December 1985, 10 days before the election was to be held, the UAW, fearing defeat, delayed the vote by filing unfair labor practice charges. In a few months, the charges were thrown out. The election was rescheduled. A few days before the rescheduled election, the UAW withdrew its request. No election was ever held. The UAW hung around but finally closed their Marysville office. By 1987, HEM had 5,000 associates, three plants, motorcycle, auto, and engine, expanding purchase of US-made parts, a reputation for quality. What came next? was a historic moment in the life of Honda. On September 17, 1987, with Governor Richard Celeste at his side, Honda Motor CEO Kume announced that Honda was committed to establishing in the United States a self-reliant motor vehicle company with resources to compete in the world market. Mr. Kume announced a five-part strategy to accomplish that goal. Number one, build a second auto plant in East Liberty, Ohio, $380 million investment to produce 150,000 cars a year expand the ANA engine plant to 500,000 engines a year, thousands of new jobs. Number two, expand Honda Engineering North America. Number three, expand Honda R&D North America with headquarters at the TRC. Number four, Increase US made parts in our cars from 50% to 75% by 1991. Number five, export up to 70,000 Ohio built cars to Japan and other countries in 1991. With the cooperation of the state of Ohio, HEM announced its intention to purchase the TRC from the state as a location for the second auto plant and the expansion of Honda R&D. We had come a long way since that night in 1977 
when three of us sat on the floor of a hotel in Columbus, talked about the character and the dedication of the employees we had met at the TRC that day, and decided to tell Governor Rose we would like to build a small plant near Marysville, Ohio. <laughs> Ten years later, because of the character and the dedication of the associates who came to work at Honda, we were prepared to commit publicly to establish a self-reliant motor vehicle company in the United States. What would come as a result of the 1987 announcement? Ham executive Tom Shoup is speaking next week. So he can tell you <laughs> it's a good story. <laughs> Thank you for hearing my story. Uh, Mr. Yoshida, thank you very much. It has been an honor to have you with us today. And I'm so glad that the weather cooperated on your trip to Ohio. And as he alluded to, uh, you're all invited back next Monday, April 30th. We're going to do part two of our Honda in America program. Tom Shoup, the current EVP and COO of Honda, will be here to talk about how things are going currently and how they plan to go in the future. Thank you, and we are adjourned.